Okay, so we can start. Um, so as I say, you know, no, no class next week and the next one would be on 2nd November. So tonight's topic is the four noble truths. Um, after the Buddha's engagement, he began a teaching career that was to span 45 years until his death aged 80. And if you recall, his first disciples were the five ascetics who originally abandoned him when they thought that Buddha uh, had uh, given up the search for enlightenment and had taken to a path of luxury. Um, the first teachings he gave to those five ascetics was that of the middle way, and that was followed by the teaching of the four noble truths. And these teachings were to become known as the first turning of the wheel of Dharma. So Dharma are the teachings, um, and it is the turning of the wheel of Dharma. So, you know, the Dharma was set in motion. Uh, and it is rather appropriate that the first teachings that the Buddha gave to the ascetics was that of the middle way. As Buddha had discovered, it is not profitable to cling to extremes. Um, I'll just read out something from one of the books I'd uh, recommended, which is Pia Darcy's The Buddha's Ancient Path. He says about Buddha, Living in the palace amidst song and dance, luxury and pleasure, the prince knew by experience that sense pleasures do not lead mankind to true happiness and deliverance. Six years of rigorous mortification, which he as an ascetic so zealously practiced in search of purification and final deliverance, brought him no reward. It was a vain and useless effort. Avoiding these two extremes, he followed a path of moral and mental training and through self-experience discovered the middle way. So we should always remember this teaching about avoiding the extremes during our practice. If we always keep on chasing our fancies and passions without restraint, that does not lead to much. On the other hand, you know, if you become too rigid, too self-righteous, then something is also going wrong. So there should be natural ease and joy in our practice. And the middle way is the path of practice, actually. The middle way is the Noble Eightfold Path. Noble Eightfold Path is the path of practice and that it is the middle way. And the, so the Four Noble Truths were realized by the Buddha while he was seated in contemplation under the Bodhi tree. And this is what Buddha talked about to the five ascetics ne next. Um, Lavinia, if we can have the first slide. Okay, so the four noble truths are the noble truth of suffering, the noble truth of the origin of suffering, the noble truth of extinction of suffering, and the noble truth of the path that leads to the extinction of suffering. And in fact, uh, we'll just talk about the first three noble truths in this lesson. And the next lesson will cover the fourth noble truth, that is the Noble Eightfold Path. Lavinia, could we have uh, the next slide, please? So this, uh, we've seen this slide already, but this is the place in Sarnath, 
uh, where Buddha expounded the four noble truths. That's uh, the, uh, for the first time, that is. And Lavinia, if we can have the next slide. So, and this is a beautiful Buddha Rupa in the Sarnath Museum, and it shows the Buddha teaching the four noble truths uh, at Sarnath. Um, okay, Lavinia, you can take the slide off. Okay, so we'll start with the first noble truth, the noble truth of suffering. Here we use the word dukkha, Sanskrit word for suffering. And the reason why we use the word dukkha generally uh, as opposed to suffering is it encompasses much more than the word suffering does. And I'll go through it and I'll explain what the word um, covers really. And this truth says, basically what it says is at the core of our human existence, there is suffering. That's part and parcel of us being human beings. So it's saying at our very core, our existence is dissatisfactory. And it is describing how we feel quite often. We feel anguish, we feel sense of not being complete, misery, sorrow, fear, unhappiness, worry, anxiety, frustration, and numerous unpleasant states. And then those unpleasant states could be something really minor, just feeling uneasy about something or just getting impatient about something. So it can range pro, from major life events, you know, like losing someone one loves, death, being made redundant, to little things like a minor irritation. So for example, you know, say we are in a queue at a supermarket and waiting to pay and someone in front of us decides that they want to get rid of all their loose change and starts counting their change uh, to pay for their shopping. And we stand there getting impatient and, you know, we say to the, ourselves, I wish he'd hurry up. Don't, doesn't he know that we don't use cash anymore? Um, and so, you know, we keep on chattering inside, getting impatient. That is suffering. It's a situation we don't like. Another example is, you know, mostly we've not been able to go on a holiday recently because of the pandemic. And we say we have a chance to go on a holiday and we go to a lovely place. We get up, we come out for breakfast and out there in front of us is white powdery sand with blue waters lapping up to the shore. And our breakfast has been laid out uh, in front of that scenery. And, you know, there's a vast array of things that we could have. And so it's, it's a really lovely idyllic setting that uh, we like to be in. And then um, we order tea. Now, you know, for those of uh, us who are not in England, generally in England, people like to drink a good, strong cup of breakfast tea, um, very hot. And so when, when we are asked what drink we want, we order tea and there we're served because we are abroad, they don't perhaps know much about tea uh, or the way we like our tea and they serve us tea, which is uh, insipid, lukewarm. And 
in front of this idyllic setting of the white sands, blue waters lapping up, anything we could eat, there's a feeling of something we do not like, something that is not quite right. That is suffering. Or, you know, we desperately want to be in a relationship, whatever we do, nothing works out. In fact, I, you know, recently I read about uh, um, someone, uh, an interview uh, 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 that someone did. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, he bought expensive cars just to woo uh, a partner. And he said, you know, nothing worked out for 10 years. He gave up, um, you know, he couldn't afford the cars and he gave up and he had an ordinary car. And he actually found the love of his life after that. So, you know, whatever we plan, there's no guarantee it's going to work out. And so, you know, we, we desperately want to be in a relationship. It doesn't work out. We are unhappy. That's suffering. Uh, we may have, another example is we may have called a call center and we've been put on hold. And then eventually someone answers and we explain our problem and they just do not seem to understand our problem. And they keep on giving us standard answers that they've been given to read out rather than trying to understand and trying to help us. So, you know, we, you know, be good Buddhists, you know, we keep our patient, uh, we, we try and be patient and we explain and we explain and, you know, we are getting nowhere. And very soon we end up shouting and screaming down the phone. And that's um, dukkha. So dukkha can range from major events uh, in our life or disappointments in life to minor irritations of things that do not quite suit me. <clears throat> and when we look at it this way, who amongst us can say that no, Buddha was not right. I've never felt suffering. And indeed, you know, chances are that even in the uh, course of this day, even if we've been gloriously happy, there have been moments not to our liking. And the first noble truth says that this is the basic fact of existence. And, you know, I've said that practice is a necessary part of Buddhism. And one, when one practices, one brings to consciousness the suffering which we might otherwise cover over and not notice. And just because we've covered over it or not noticed, it does not mean that it will go away. Even in unconsciousness, it can simmer and build. And we need to bring that dukkha that is there into consciousness so that we can acknowledge it and then we can work with it. And this is the first step in transforming dukkha. So for example, you know, say we're, we're living with someone and uh, they have a habit of not putting the milk back in the fridge and you know, we come down for our breakfast and we see the milk lying outside the fridge and, you know, anger wells up in us. So we notice that anger and we say to ourselves, there is anger. We actually notice it that is bringing it to awareness. And we, when we come to the third noble truth, we will see that it says that there is cessation of suffering. But for cessation to occur, we must first acknowledge and be aware of suffering in all its manifestations, big and small, and acknowledge it. Buddha said, suffering I teach and the way out of suffering. And the way out of suffering is actually to walk our way through all our sufferings. We, it won't just magically disappear just because we have decided to embark on a path of Buddhism. 
we have to come across our sufferings, acknowledge it, and work with it. One of the teachers who teaches at the Buddhist society gave this example of her early days in the practice of Buddhism. She was thinking to herself, surely, you know, I'm a very reasonable, even-minded person. I do not easily get irritated or annoyed or impatient. So she decided to do an experiment. She took a handful of paper clips and put them in her right pocket. And during the course of the day, when she noticed a reaction of, no, not now, oh, hurry up, and so on, come up, she would transfer a paper clip from her right pocket to her left pocket. And she found that by the end of the day, she had run out of paper clips in her right pocket. That is the nature of suffering. And that is what the first noble truth is saying. In the words of the Buddha, he say, what then monks is the noble truth of suffering? Birth is suffering, decay is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering. To be in situations one does not like is suffering. The separation from what one likes is suffering. Not to get what one wants is suffering. You know, from, from this we might conclude that Buddhism is a very gloomy religion seeming to talk only of suffering. However, Buddha was just stating a fact which he was then inviting us to observe. He does not deny that there are moments of great joy and happiness. And in fact, you know, I say that, you know, if, if we are conjoined with things that we enjoy, you know, we should be grateful for that. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we can en enjoy those things and there are moments of joy and happiness, but Buddha does not need to talk about joy and happiness because generally we do not need a religion to accept happiness very often. However, Happiness, if seen with deluded seeing, can still be suffering. Because according to Buddhism, there is nothing permanent. And sooner or la later, the circumstances that lead to our happiness will change. And therefore, even happy, pleasant events are actually dukkha in our mundane world. Okay, so now we will go on to the second noble truth of the origin of suffering. So it is natural to ask what lies at the bottom of this unsatisfactoriness? Why do we suffer? And this is what the second noble truth looks at. <clears throat> In a word, what underlies our suffering is craving, called Trishna in Sanskrit, or sometimes translated as thirst, thirst for something. So that is what underlies our suffering. It is our underlying craving for what is pleasant and avoiding what is unpleasant. That lies at the bottom of our suffering. So in the words of uh, Buddha again, what then monks is the noble truth of the origin of suffering? It is craving or thirst 
that gives rise to rebirth, together with the pleasure and greed that se seeks delight here and there. It's the craving or thirst for sensual pleasure, the craving or thirst for further existence, the craving or thirst for non-existence. So the craving or thirst for non-existence is when we want to get rid of things that we don't like. So when we experience something pleasant, we want it to continue. We will rearrange the world, the circumstances, so that we can have more of it. It does not matter whether what gives us pleasure is something major like falling in love or something small like enjoying a particular dish. The underlying mechanism of wanting it to continue is the same. So I'll give a personal example. So, you know, in my younger days, you know, there were, we, uh, we had, uh, had a group of friends, um, about um, uh, 10 of us who would get together regularly and we would do things together. We would meet several times a week. And as time went on, obviously everyone's lives changed. You know, they got married, they had children, and we really didn't see much of each other. And uh, a few years ago, uh, one of the friends decided that we should have a reunion. And uh, so she arranged a reunion at her place and I thoroughly enjoyed meeting with everyone. And, you know, when I went home, I was saying to myself, you know, I must plan another one. And, you know, before I knew it, you know, I was thinking of, you know, when I can plan it, I was thinking of, you know, what sort of things uh, there could be on the menu. And so, you know, the mind just churned on and churned on, you know, trying to repeat this experience that I found pleasant. Now, the thing is, um, you know, that I found it pleasant, maybe someone else did not find it pleasant. And maybe, you know, when I uh, organized uh, another re reunion, maybe not everyone would have been perhaps keen to attend or, um, you know, um, the, ideal circumstances that I was planning uh, to have the reuni reunion, maybe not, may, they may not work out. You know, the things that I wanted to be on the menu, uh, maybe I could not find those things. So, um, you know, this picture building that we have, which is caused by our craving and, you know, wanting to repeat the experience. That is, you know, this is an example of how we often want to repeat the experience and how we build pictures about it and how, uh, you know, the pictures may work out, in which case we may be momentarily happy or they may not work out. You know, like uh, in the example I gave, you know, other, others may not be very keen on attending um, a second reunion and, you know, I'd be left disappointed. That is suffering, all based on my craving and, and craving that led to, you know, this building of pictures, wanting to repeat a pleasant experience. So Buddhism actually gets us to examine our inner world that we are carrying in our heads. We've built a picture of what the world is, how one thing can lead to another, and then we manipulate things and circumstances to bring about pleasant experiences and avoiding unpleasant ones. And when we really look at this and we look at it in meditation and in our practice, it, that those are the tools that enable us to look at all this. When we look at it, we realize that we are constantly in this flood of manipulating circumstances and things, constantly picking and choosing. We do not realize that it's a flood. It really is a flood. And it's only when we start practicing 
And when we start seeing all these things in meditation, that we realize how constant it is. And actually, if we, if we think about it, actually, there should be no problem with picking and choosing. Uh, you know, after all, you know, what is wrong with wanting something pleasant and wanting to avoid something unpleasant? You know, it's natural as human beings that we want pleasant experiences and we want to avoid unpleasant ones. However, in looking at it this way, we are missing one thing, which is that our view of the world is flawed. The pictures that we build are flawed. And that flow is referred to in Buddhism as avidya, basic ignorance. It's one of the three fires, you know, the, so we talked about three fires last time, the fire of desire, which is, you know, what I've just been talking about, and it's opposite wanting to get rid of something, which is also a form of desire, as I explained last time, because both forms, wanting something or wanting to get rid of something that we don't like, are trying to manipulate circumstances to create a pleasant existence for us. So those are the first two fires. The third fire is avidya, basic ignorance, not knowing the way things really are. And the way things really are, are that they are impermanent at their very core. They have a mark of suffering and they do not have a self identity of their own. And actually all these three um, uh, signs of being, uh, are basically saying that everything is impermanent. And if you recall that teaching, everything is impermanent from moment to moment. So, so, that, so it's all, so that avidya then gets us to build all these pictures and then we believe in those pictures and, we've, uh, and then we're disappointed when when those pictures do not work out. So at this moment, uh, I will not go into how this flawed view of the world arises, but Buddhism does explain in minute detail how this de deluded seeing arises. And the prime doctrine where this is explained is that of Praticca Samupada, uh, which is translated as the teaching of dependent arising and also the teaching uh, of karma. And we will actually be covering both these topics in the fifth lesson. Let me just give another, uh, uh, let me give you a story of the nature of desire that just draws us in. So there, in the story, there is a novice monk who is meditating and uh, he's deep in meditation, but suddenly he notices a golden ball uh, hopping in front of him and Fascinated by this golden ball that's hopping in front of him, he wants to get hold of it. And he leans forward from his meditation cushion uh, and tries to get hold of it. And as soon as he tries to get hold of it, the ball hops away. So the monk le leans a little bit more forward, tries to grab it, and every time he grabs it, the ball hops away. So very soon the monk is on his feet, trying to grab the ball, but the ball just keeps on going away from him. And very soon the ball comes to a tree, uh, the monk coming after, uh, after the ball, and the monk tries to grab the ball, the ball goes up the tree, and the monk starts going after 
the ball. The ball goes to the lower branches and the monk follows it on the lower branches and every time the ball hops away. And very soon, the ball is on the higher branches and, very, uh, and, and the monk is following them and he's on the high branches and they are swaying and suddenly in that moment of the branches swaying, he comes to himself and realizes that he's in danger. Fear grips him because um, he's on a uh, you know, flimsy branch swaying and he, there's no way he can get down. And the monk who told this story at the Buddhist society, in fact, says, you know, it served him right. And he says, you know, his fellow brothers saw him next morning swaying on the branch and they got a ladder and they got him out. But this is what desire this does to us. This is what desire is. It leaves us in a very precarious position quite often. So to summarize the second truth, the basic cause of suffering is our desire and craving, and that craving is rooted in our ignorance of the way things really are. Okay, so now we can go on to the third noble truth. And the third noble truth basically says that there is extinction to suffering. So the Buddha said, what then monks is the noble truth of stopping of suffering? It is the extinction of that craving or thirst, renouncing it, forsaking it, liberation and detachment from it. So being blown about here and there by our desires, by our passions, by our picking and choosing, by our picture building is called samsara. That's the mundane world we are in is samsara. And if we really look at our existence, we're just being blown about here and there by our picking and choosing by our passions. And liberation from samsara is called nirvana. Nirvana has the roots nir, meaning extinguishing, and va, meaning blowing, as in the wind, you know, so blowing in the wind. So near means extinguishing, and va means blowing in the wind. And when they're put together, nirvana is the cessation of being blown about here and there. So we're not blown about here and there, and that is the liberation from suffering. And the Buddha's great insight was that it is possible to be liberated from dukkha. We're not doomed to be caught up in this round of dukkha forever. But the choice is ours, whether we want to be in this continuous round of dukkha or to be liberated from it. But to be liberated from it, we have to do something about it we have to walk the path set up by Buddha. And that is the Noble Eightfold Path, which we will talk about next week. Nirvana is said to be ineffable. In other words, it cannot be described in words. To know it, one has to experience it, which means to walk the Buddha's path. It is to open up a new seeing, but you know, our normal way of seeing is so ingrained in us that the path is long and it needs a real constant effort to walk it. So Buddha says, it occurred to me monks that this Dharma I've realized is deep, hard to see, 
hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, beyond mere reasoning, subtle and intelligible to the, to the wise. But this generation delights, revels, and rejoices in sensual pleasures. For a generation delighting, reveling, and rejoicing in sensual pleasures, it is hard to see the extinction of craving, dispersed dispassion, cessation, nirvana. So Buddha himself is saying it is hard. But also it's interesting, you know, these are Buddha's words, which he spoke almost two and a half thousand years ago. So he, uh, I'll just read it out again. It occurred to me monks that this Dharma I've realized is deep, hard to see, hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, beyond mere reasoning, subtle and intelligible to the wise. So here, beyond mere reasoning means that we cannot just think our way through it. We cannot just listen to lots of talks and lots of courses and uh, read lots of books. And if only if it's explained to us just correctly, just in the right way, then we'll come to understand it. He's saying it's beyond mere reasoning. So that means we're not going to understand it simply through that means only, by study only. Uh, and that is why practice is necessary. And he says, it is hard to understand. Uh, but uh, it, is, it is peaceful and sublime. Sublime because it's beyond words. But he says it is intelligible to the wise. And here I should actually qualify this, um, although it's intelligible to the wise, that it doesn't mean that only certain people can uh, penetrate it. Each one and every one of his, uh, each and every one of us is capable of getting that understanding uh, uh, to, to, to see um, the, to, well, to, to see Buddha's insight actually. Uh, each and every one of us is capable of that. In fact, Buddha said, beings, but all beings, have the power and the wisdom of the Tathagata. Tathagata is another appellation for the Buddha. It means thus gone. So he's gone beyond, gone beyond our normal way of saying, gone beyond words. Uh, so, so he says, each, uh, all beings, but all beings have the power and the wisdom of the Tathagata. In other words, he's saying all of us have the capacity to get that insight. But he then goes on to say here, for a generation delighting, reveling, and rejoicing in sensual pleasures, it is hard to see the extinction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nirvana. And as I say, Buddha said these words two and a half thousand years ago. And they could actually, he could be talking to us today. You know, isn't our generation also delighting, reveling, and rejoicing in sensual pleasures? You know, so what he said applies to us. You know, between Buddha's time and our time, we have had so many scientific advances. Our lives are incomparably easier compared to Buddha's time. You know, at this moment, you know, as uh, we discovered at the start, we have someone listening to this talk from Australia, from, uh, from the States, from Canada. And that is possible today. It would not have been possible in Buddha's time. You know, we've had a pandemic and we now have a vaccination, which means, you know, the danger of dying is much, much reduced now. So we know we have made all these advances in science, medicine, and yet 
our human condition actually still remains the same. So, you know, what the human condition was in Buddha's time and what Buddha was talking about to us as human beings still applies to us today. No matter how much we have tried to improve our lives, it still applies to us today. Okay, so that brings us to the end of today's talk. Uh, so we can um, open uh, it to questions. To so you can ask questions. You, if you have any comments, you're welcome to make them. You can unmute yourself, or if you wish, you can put questions in chat, and Lavinia will read the questions out. While we're waiting for the questions, um, I thought, uh, you know, because I've just finished a little bit early, I, th I thought it might be useful if I gave one story, because if you recall, I had said in the first lesson that Buddha's life story is not simply a historical account. It's an allegorical account. It's a teaching device. So the incidences we have in his life are supposed to make teaching points. And I'd say that there's a little bit of mythology as well in his life, uh, 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 life as recounted in the doctrine. Um, and, uh, and I'd say that that doesn't mean, you know, these days, you know, we, being very rational, say, you know, I'll only listen to something that is rational. I will, you know, all these mumbo jumbo about myth, uh, mythical creatures, etc. That's not what I'm interested in. You know, Buddha said, you know, test the truth for yourself. And, you know, I will only uh, uh, look at things, you know, that make, you know, black and white sense to me. And that would be a pity if you look at uh, the doctrine that way. Uh, so as I say, you know, mythology is one of those things, you know, which we perhaps find difficult to accept, um, you know, in our uh, uh, logical and rational age, uh, or so-called rational age, because uh, under, underlying uh, what, what we think is rational is a lot of irrationality as well as we discover once we go through the Buddhist path. Uh, but um, the reason why mythological um, stories exist is because they are making points that are very, very profound and uh, putting them in just black and white will not have the same impact as them put out as mythology. So I just wanted to recount one of those uh, things which is put down as mythology. Uh, so this is at the stage where Buddha is uh, seated under the Bodhi tree before his enlightenment. And uh, uh, so he's at the point of achieving enlightenment. So there is a mythological creature called Mara and Mara uh, uh, represents actually a world of change the world that, uh, you know, we sometimes find very frightening because, you know, we can't have things that we want, things that we want are taken away from us. And Mara, uh, we, we will actually come across Mara again in the fifth uh, lesson in um, the Wheel of Life. So Mara represents this change and Mara, quite likes to keep his subjects, that is all of us, in his domain. He does not like to lose his subjects because once uh, there is enlightenment, then uh, Mara has lost that subject from its domain. So Mara likes to keep um, all of us bound to samsara. So, but Buddha was, at the point of enlightenment uh, when he was under the Bodhi tree. And Mara 
so that he is about to lose one of his subjects. So he tried out three ruses, three tricks to keep Buddha bound to this world of change. And actually, this, uh, I'll, I'll recount what those three uh, ruses or tricks were. But the interesting thing is that when we go through our practice, we ourselves see these things coming up. So the first thing that comes up is rational thinking. So, you know, we get angry and we know that as Buddhists, we should not have got angry, but, you know, we then try to justify to ourselves why we got angry. We say, you know, it was totally unreasonable of that person to do so and so. And, you know, he or she is always doing that. And so we try and, you know, say, uh, use rational thinking to justify our actions. And this is about keeping us bound to samsara. So in Buddha's case, what um, Mara did was he pleaded with Buddha. He said, Buddha, you are brought, born as a prince. You are born to rule. Surely you've done enough. Isn't it now time to go back to the palace and do your duty? And quite often, this rational thinking that arises is, is very, very um, uh, appealing. Uh, uh, and, and especially if it's something we like, you know, we will make it very appealing. Um, so that's the first ruse that uh, arises. And um, uh, Buddha saw through this and had nothing to do with it. He did not fall for it. So Mara tried another trick. He got his alluring daughters in front of Buddha in their elaborate dresses and jewelry dancing in front of Buddha. And this represents our deepest desires. And if, and, you know, if in during our practice, we will see that we'll come across these deepest desires but Buddha was beyond this too, and he did not fall for it. He did not fall for the deepest, you know, basically, you know, lustful desires. So the Mara tried a third trick. Now I'll just ask everyone. So Mara tried uh, rational thinking uh, to justify uh, or, or, to, or to appeal to Buddha to stay in samsara. He tried lust basically to, uh, so that Buddha remains in samsara. And then he tried the third thing. So I want to ask others if they can work out or, or say, you know, you can you unmute, unmute yourself and say, what, what do you think the third ruse was? Something that is more powerful than you know, rational thinking is more powerful than lust. What would that be? What did he try to keep Buddha entangled in samsara? Any guesses? Or if you know, you can, you know, please say so. I'm thinking maybe fear or guilt. Exactly, exactly. You've got it. Oh, sorry, is that Nat, Nat who said that? Yeah, Nat. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Yes, yes. That's exactly it. Yes. So something that has even more energy than a rational thinking and then lust is fear. So, uh, so what Mara tried was he sent his army of his sons in front of the Buddha to frighten, you know, to, to, to get the arousal of fear in Buddha. But that did not work either because Buddha was beyond all those things. And then he went on to enlightenment. So this is a very interesting story of how mythology actually comes in uh, Buddhist doctrine. Never ever, you know, discard mythology. You know, perhaps we may not understand it, uh, but if we just carry on with the practice, then it'll, it'll make perfect sense actually.
Okay, so now we can go on to the questions. Um, so does anyone want to unmute themselves and ask a question? Hi, Rohit, I've got some questions in the chat. Okay. In the meanwhile. Right. Sorry, excuse me. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, the first question we have tonight is asking, isn't Buddhism the craving for enlightenment itself? Okay. Yes. Um, um, right. Okay. So, um, you know, we have to start off somewhere. And we start off from the place where we are at. And the place we are at, the, what we understand is our mundane world, which consists of thought, of uh, uh, you know, of desires, etc. And so, to start off with, yes, you, you know, wanting enlightenment or wanting to find out what we are staging is a form of desire, and that energy drives us on. But you know, as our practice progresses, it the, it doesn't become a desire. It's just something that we, you know, having put one step in front of another and, you know, having seen that it makes sense, you know, that in itself then carries us forward. It's not a desire anymore. It'll just carry us. But, you know, to start with, it may be seen as a desire, um, so that's the answer to that question, but this reminds me of something else, which I think it's worth saying as well. You know, all these energies that are in desire or ill will or anger are actually not something that we have to sort of get rid of. It's not a question of having to get rid of those energies. It is a question of transformation of those energies. We are never ever going to be able to get rid of those energies because those energies are life forces. They're greater than us. And we're never ever going to succeed in saying that you know, those energies must not exist because we are beyond them. So what happens in the practice is not that we get rid of desire or we get rid of ill will or anger, it, these energies are then transformed into something that is useful. All these energies have a useful component to it. Desire actually has, is very useful actually, because it is desire that gets us to, you know, go out and work and earn some money for our food and, uh, and shelter. Uh, uh, did, you know, desire is also responsible for procreation. So, you know, there it performs a useful function. The problem is that when it comes in conjunction with the flawed seeing that we have, then the desires are. Uh, uh, make us blind basically. So it's say that, you know, there's a saying that passions are blind, that, that's what it is. You know, so, so blind desire is very harmful. But what Buddhist practice does is it actually transforms all these energies into the life forces which they are. And then they become useful. So, um, and, 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 you know, they are always there. You know, we, we can always act out of them in a useful way, uh, but the practice makes us understand, you know, how those energies are part of us, part of all of us, and how they, uh, they function. Uh, so, uh, so desire, uh, you know, going back to the question, desire seen with our deluded at, at flawed seeing, we do need it perhaps to get started, but eventually it does fall off. 
and and you know particularly you know when the insight arises that desire is no longer desire as we understand it that desire is just a useful life force okay long-winded answer but um, i hope that helps thanks so much rohit okay are there any more questions at all yes we have more questions in the chat yeah so the next question is asking how do we break free from the craving to reach a good productive meditation i find i'm often distracted by how am i doing how poorly i'm doing okay um you know um i've said that the path is long it's difficult and uh provided we have the correct guidance, then we just have to keep on going uh, and do not, you know, we should not be judging ourselves. Uh, actually, you know, um, here again in the West, you know, we're very res result oriented. You know, we say that I've been doing this for, you know, a uh, month, two months, six months, you know, results should come, but, we actually don't know, really, if we all come to it, we really, because we don't know what enlightenment is, we don't actually know what those results should be. So, um, you know, if what you're seeing is your mind is in a flood of thinking, which you were not aware of, that itself is progress, actually. So, you know, in a way, we ourselves are not able to judge it. And, you know, this is why we need a teacher to guide us. And it is true that, you know, we can do meditation for years and years and, you know, thoughts still come in. And, you know, I, uh, from personal experience and uh, from speaking to other people, uh, you, you, you know, you, you cannot stop thoughts completely. Again, they are part of how we are. You know, thinking is part of us. Um, what so so trying to say that thoughts should not happen is futile. What we are trying to do is not engage with thoughts. So they may come in, but as soon as we realize they've come in, we let go of the thoughts and we go back into the uh, awareness of the breath. If that's our meditation is following awareness of the breath, then we go back to it. So it's this disengaging from following the thoughts, which is the useful part. And initially, that is, that is what produces, um, uh, you know, the results that actually flow through. And, and uh, as I say, we are in, we, we really can't judge it for ourselves because we actually don't know what, what uh, uh, what the end result is. Uh, you know, if, if you try and uh, guess at the end result, I can assure you that if you are just trying to think your way through what that end result is, it would be quite wide of the mark. And because we don't understand that, we cannot say that I'm making progress, I'm not making progress. So what we do is we just walk the Buddha's path, we put one step in front of another, make sure that we do it under good guidance, a good teacher, and then a remarkable thing happens. What we find is that, you know, we do our bit, we do not then worry about what the results are or are not, we are just walking the path, and then from the other side comes a helping hand, it's like a grace opens up. And, you know, we may not realize it, but our thinking uh, and everything, you know, changes gradually. And, and because it's happening gradually, we may not notice it. But, you know, a few years after Buddhist practice, you know, you may realize, you know, this particular thing would have really got me quite hung up about uh, something. You know, it might have got me annoyed or I might have reacted to it in a different way. Now, today I've reacted it, uh, to it in a quite a different way. And we suddenly realize that, you know, you know, all those results are coming through. It's just that we can't see it. Um, but, you know, for that to happen, the effort has to be put in. So, you know, the effort has to be put in, 
but you know we shouldn't get too hung up about the progress I am making. You know that is, um, as I say, you know perhaps a disease of the West, um, which is not so helpful in this particular practice. Thank you, Lavinia. Thanks so much. All right, so the next question is asking, I saw you have a teacher called Ajahn Barry Subado teaching the basic meditation class on Thursday this week. Would it be a good place to try out a meditation for a beginner? Yes, definitely. Uh, he, the Thursday um, uh, evening uh, meditation classes are a good place to start uh, meditation. And, uh, you know, if you're new to meditation, completely new to meditation, then do make it known to the teacher that you're completely new. Um, and, uh, or, and also, uh, you know, if, if you're not quite so, so, because this class is aimed at beginners, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I mean, some of you may already know, but if there are people who do not know, you know, what is done in meditation, then uh, uh, the last talk of the course covers that. So, uh, you know, we will be covering it as to what we do, but for the actual meditation practice, uh, Thursday evening class is definitely a very good class to begin it, uh, begin uh, uh, meditation. I, I myself actually uh, started meditation with the Thursday meditation class many, many years ago. Thanks a lot. All right, we have some more questions here. Um, shall I read the next one? Yeah, yeah, please. Good. All right, so the next one is asking, what is the concept of death according to Buddhism? Does it believe in rebirth or once you are dead, you are dead and that is it? Okay, so we uh, again, this is something we'll cover in the fifth uh, lesson where we talk about rebirth. Uh, so Buddhism believes in rebirth, uh, but then, uh, you know, you'd wonder, you know, if there is no I, you know, who is reborn? And uh, so basically there is rebirth and it's rebirth of, um, if I can put it this way, our mental energies that we've accumulated, you know, all this picture building that I've talked about through craving, you know, that leaves a mark, that leaves traces, and they do not die away just because the physical body has died. And that is what is reborn. So, you know, if, if we have been prone to be very uh, angry or lustful, you know, that will leave traces and those sort of characteristics will be reborn um, in the new life. And, um, also, to take this to a, another prof, more profound level uh, uh, to answer the question. So, uh, you know, this, you know, what I've said actually does answer the question that there is rebirth and that rebirth is, you know, the energies that we've built up during this life, which do, do not die away and are reborn. Um, uh, so, you know, when Buddha talks about liberation, when there is nirvana, then this concept of life and death does not exist. Any concepts we can think of do not exist. You know, uh, nirvana is beyond concepts, beyond thought. It, we, we cannot understand with our ordinary mind. And in nirvana, there is no life, uh, there is no death. It, it is beyond concepts. What, what we call rebirth is actually rebirth of a thought. A thought, a concept is actually a rebirth. As long as those thoughts and concepts do not happen, then there is no rebirth. So, there, uh, so in Buddhism, there is rebirth, but it's rebirth while we are in the deluded state, in samsara. And it can last from life to life. It can life, last many lifetimes. But when liberation is obtained, 
that brings that process to an end. There is no, no rebirth, there is no birth, there is no death. As to what it is, we cannot put it in words, it's beyond words, if we call it that not, uh, you know, we, we do not die in that realm, that's wrong. If we say we are not born in that realm, that's wrong. So, you know, all these um, um, uh, uh, questions about birth, re, uh, uh, rebirth, death, etc., only arise while we are in the realm of samsara. In other words, they only arise while we are in our conceptual thinking. The, the true understanding, the liberation happens when we go beyond our conceptual thinking. And, you know, many, you know, I keep on saying that um, there is no river, uh, sorry, I, we cannot put uh, liberation, enlightenment into words. It's beyond words, beyond concepts. And a lot of, a lot of people uh, find that really annoying because again, you know, uh, in uh, our age, we want to know exactly, you know, what everything is and we feel we must be able to understand it. Um, and just for that sake of that, as I say, it cannot be put in words. It cannot uh, ever be described. Uh, and, and Buddhist doctrine does not actually describe it. It only describes the path that leads to it. But just to give an inkling of those states, um, you know, a musician, when playing music and say it's a very highly achieved, competent musician playing a piece of music, you know, and, and they're playing really well. You know, in, when they're playing really well, there is only the playing of the music. There is no concept of them playing the music. There is no concept of how the audience is reacting to it. There is only the music, there is only the playing, there is no player, it all merges into one. Uh, I hope that sort of gives you an inkling of, of what that state is. There is no subject, there is no object, it all merges into one. There is just response to circumstances as they are. Okay, Lavinia. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, all right. So the next question is asking, what is the difference between letting go of thoughts and getting rid of thoughts? Or is it the same? No, they, they are different. So getting rid of thoughts basically implies we do not want those thoughts. And, uh, you know, they shouldn't be there. And as I just explained, we will never succeed with that because as human beings, we have this capacity for thinking. And actually it is a gift, you know, this, this capacity for thinking we have is a gift and we, we do not need to get rid of that gift. And I'll tell you how we can use it usefully. Uh, but uh, so to answer your question, we do not get rid of thoughts. Uh, that means, you know, we are saying thoughts must, must not arise. Uh, what, what we do is not engage with the thoughts. So we are, when we are caught up in a thought stream, then we recognize that we are in a thought stream and we let go of it. We are not saying that, you know, it should not be there because we're never ever going to succeed with that. You know, thoughts will keep on arising. But, uh, you know, we can learn to disengage from the thoughts and that's what we're learning to do. So, you know, I say that thoughts and thinking do have a useful purpose. The useful purpose is, you know, like I've said in science, we've made a lot of progress and, you know, uh, all the advances in science, medicine have happened because we have this conceptual thought. So that conceptual thought is very useful. That, is, that has been responsible for the uh, physical compass that we are able to have. The problem is that conceptual thought 
is actually not a true representation of the true reality. It, it, at, at best, we, we can say it's an approximation of true reality. And that a, approximation of that true reality works within that framework. You know, it works within the conceptual framework that we built up and therefore it works in science. And therefore, you know, with, through science, you know, we can manipulate ideas and thoughts and it, it gives us useful results. But where it falls short is when it comes across our passions, then our thinking minds cannot deal with it. They do not know how to deal with passions. You know, sometimes we think we're being very rational and we, you know, we are, say we, we've got to make up our mind and say two people, there's a, a choice of two things. And, uh, you know, there's, you know, really at the bottom of the, uh, uh, of the choice, there's something, you know, we inherently dislike and we are not willing to voice it. And we uh, actually pick that because, you know, there's something about us that wants to pick that. And then uh, having picked that, you know, we, we have to justify our, uh, our choice. Uh, you know, uh, so what we do then is we think of all sorts of rational things. So, you know, we think that, you know, we've thought through it rationally and that well, therefore we've come to a decision, but underlying that, all that is some passion or things that we really want certain way. And that's what, why we've made up our mind. And then a justification comes after it. So, you know, in that way, the thought does not uh, work with the passions. Or, you know, given this example of, you know, we might have been dieting and, you know, we managed to diet very successfully for five days. It comes the weekend and, and you know, there's a packet of biscuit lying in front of us. And we um, say to ourselves, you know, it'd be fine to have this one biscuit. It's only so, so many calories. So we eat that one biscuit. And before we know it, we've eaten the whole packet. Where is the rational thought? We, we know very well that, you know, we are dieting. We should not be consuming all those calories, but something has taken us over and rational thought does not reach there. So, so you know, rational thought has a purpose provided it is used correctly. The way we can look at it is that it is a tool that we've been given. I, I, I say it's a gift that we've been given. So as a gift, as a tool we have, if we use it correctly, then great things will come out of it. But problem is, you know, when we use it incorrectly and when, the, when it combines with the passions, it really, really me, misleads us and leads us astray. Okay, Lavinia. Thank you so much, Rohit. Um, do we have time for some more questions? Uh, uh, yes, yes, we do. Okay, thanks. All right, so the next question question is asking, I struggle with these because internalized conditioning or oppression tries to convince me my needs and desires are invalid. In unlearning that conditioning, I'm working on seeing my own experience and needs as valid, but this lesson feels contradictory to that. Okay, sorry, could you read that out again? And that, that's from Ali who's also saying, I can come off mute and explain if yeah, needed. Yeah, that, so that, maybe that, you that, want to- Yeah, that would be very yourself, useful. Ali. And, and yeah. uh, if you also, you know, uh, sorry, what's the name? Ali, it's Ali, yeah. Yeah, sorry, could you, could you actually, you know, there's a way to raise hand. Do you know how to do that? Because then I know who's speaking. There's so many people I can't see who's speaking. So, oh yes, Ali. Okay, I can see you. I can see you now. 
Are you able to put your video on? If, if not, it doesn't matter, but if you are, it, it'd be helpful, but otherwise ask your question. Oh, yes. great. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, okay, so, oh, I'll lower my hand. Um, just in doing a lot of, of awareness around, I'm becoming aware of a lot of the systems of oppression and how they affect different groups of people in different ways. And, um, and in doing that, I'm learning that one of the things that we've been taught is that our own experiences and needs are, we've been taught that they're not valid when they are. So for example, um, uh, for women, systematically, women have been taught that they are, um, that we should question ourselves and, you know, put the needs of others in front of our own, because that keeps us um, oppressed in a way that, that the patriarchy stays in power, not to <laughs> dive into all of it. Um, but in, in learning this teaching, I struggle because I don't want to slip into that same feeling of, you know, if I have a, a desire, I don't want to automatically consider it invalid or frivolous, or I don't want to dismiss it. Um, yeah. So I guess I'm wondering what the, what the difference, like, is there a way to maybe we explore the deeper, the what's beneath the craving? Like maybe we look at the craving and see what's okay. What's superficial about this? What is actually the deeper desire that speaks yeah. to my human needs yeah. of feeling safe or supported? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Okay. So, um, uh, First of all, you know, the path is gradual. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because, uh, you know, this way of looking uh, at things is so um, uh, different to what we have normally done in our lives, which is, you know, use our education and thinking to think through and decide various things, because we are so used to that. And we're not just used to learning this awareness of what's going on inside us. It's so new to us. What we have to start off is with little things uh, in our practice. Uh, and um, so, you know, the questions you're asking are really big questions. Um, and maybe, you know, you do not have the tools just yet to understand how to apply that to the bigger questions. Mm. Uh, you know, that will come actually. So what, what happens is, you know, as our practice goes on, as we work with the little, little things, um, we build up strength, uh, we build up uh, uh, some sort of understanding, if I can put it that way, um, uh, uh, that then enables us to deal with the bigger issues. Uh, and so, you know, you, 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 there's no need to sort of dismiss those bigger issues, you know, of oppression of women, for example. And um, what happens is, that as your practice goes on, a sort of clarity builds in. So every thing, the way you look at it, there's a clarity about it. So, you know, when we are using, you know, with other practice in our everyday lives, we're just using thought and thinking and rational thinking. Sometimes it's all muddled up actually. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, muddled up, biased, you know, where we're already bringing, you know, our passions uh, uh, or even passions uh, that we're not aware of into it. And so, so it's not really clear thinking. Um, uh, so, but we are doing, uh, you know, we're trying to do our best and trying to come to some sort of understanding of, you know, say a situation that women find themselves in, um, you know, um, with, with the tools that we have. But what you will find as the practice goes on uh, and it becomes, um, you know, part of you, is a clarity bill comes in. And with that clarity, you can think through those issues without it being um, muddied by uh, uh, unsaid or unknown biases or uh, things that you're not aware of, you know, which made you say certain things. So, you know, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a gradual process and, uh, you know, unfortunately, because it's gradual, you know, you, you won't be, applied to, be able to apply the tools just yet, but in time, you, you, it, it will come about, actually. That's Thank you. Good. Okay. Uh, Lavinia? Thanks so much, Rohit. 
All right, I can see one last question here. Mm -hmm. And this is asking, isn't the path and practice the core of Buddhism? I learning doctrine and conceptualization is empty without practice. Uh, sorry, again, you know, the person who asked the question, if they can uh, raise their hand. So what is the name of the person, uh, Lavinia? I'm not sure if the person oh, okay. wants to re remain anonymous. Uh, if you do, that's fine. That's not a problem. Uh, um, in which case I will uh, if you just... want you can unmute yourself oh. yeah that, that, that's <laughs> me <laughs> okay can you put your hand up as well so I can then see you okay great okay yeah. <laughs> the, the, the question uh, came from me and it was actually bouncing off something that you said yeah um, about um, about also the importance of practice and things being very progressive so yeah. isn't the practice actually at the core and the learning and the conceptualization or whatever insight is just going around to support this and not the other way around if it makes sense okay uh, you know, um, the, uh, you, you need both, actually. Uh, and I think you need both uh, together. Uh, it's like, you know, when you're walking, you know, you walk with the left mm. leg and then you walk with the right leg. So if you say left leg is the uh, conceptual or intellectual or, or, or theoretical part, and the right leg is the practice part. You know, if you just kept on walking with, uh, say, just the intellectual part, are you taking, if you, if your right leg remains where it is and you just advance your, keep on advancing your left leg, you'll soon fall down. Likewise, if you uh, are stood and if you advance with your right leg, which is practice, and you take one step and then you take another step, not moving the left leg at all, and you take another step, very soon, you, you, you know, again, you will fall down. So, whereas you want to keep on walking, and to keep on walking, both the left leg and the right leg have to move in tandem. So, you know, the, the, the study part and the practice part go together. They support each other. It's not like one comes before another, they both support each other. But it is true to say that when you come to the realization of what the teachings are pointing to, then at that stage, you do not need the study framework anymore because you have the insight and then you're complete. So at that stage, you do not need mm. the study part, but the study part while training is necessary and very useful. Mm. And uh, the, the last bit I said about not needing the uh, uh, study part, uh, you know, when the realization has come in, is actually described by this following simile in Buddhism. Say, you know, you are um, uh, at, at a shore and, further, and away from you is an island. And, and you are crossing to an crossing island. The river, yeah. Yeah, or, or a river, yeah. Then you need a raft or a boat. So, you know, this shore is where we are. The, the island is the other shore, you know, where we're going to, uh, you know, with uh, following Buddhism. So once you've arrived at the other shore, then you know, you do not need the raft anymore. And, you know, if you carry the raft on your back everywhere you go on the island, then that's really not necessary. That's, mm -hmm. that's a simile that's used in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Lavinia. I was, I was, I think... just, I was uh, I think to clarify, I was just saying that because it's not my yeah. first approach to Buddhism, but right. the first time I had a very intellectual approach yeah. learning. Yeah. And I didn't learn much anyway because of this, yes. um, because I didn't anchor in any practice. 
Yeah. Um, know that this time I, I, I look at it totally differently from the daily life and the practice and yes. the meditation. It had changed my understanding totally. Yes. Um, so that's so, why I, I, I was rooting in, in practice. Yeah. So Tilly, that's actually very useful. You know what you've said. I hope uh, other people have listened to it and understood it because, you know, this is... Uh, what you discovered is, is, is something very useful, that the whole thing really only becomes alive, you know, when uh, mm -hmm. the practice is put together with um, the study. Mm. Okay, Thank so you. we've come to eight o'clock, so we can end the lesson today. Just a reminder, uh, as, as I gave earlier, there's no uh, lesson next week, We'll meet in two weeks time on second. And if you are not in um, England or Britain, then do check your, uh, what your local time should be because our clocks are um, going back uh, during this period. So you know, the time difference may have changed. Okay.